<laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks for sharing with us in the chat. You are at the webinar titled Grant Seeking Solo. I know you can read, but today, securing awards with limited staff. And I know that's why you're here because a lot of you wear multiple hats. So you're limited staff. You already know how you can engage today. You're on mute, but you've been typing already in the chat. So feel free to continue to type in the chat. But we would love you to type your questions in the Q&A. I think um, we have some team members from Grant Station that can answer them pretty fast. So we'll get them at the end. You're going to get the recording and the slides by later today or early in the morning. Um, do me a favor. When you leave or when you close this window, there's going to be a, a survey that's going to pop up. I would love if you would answer that survey um, for me. Just two quick questions. Take you less than two minutes. But I'm going to get ready to move out of the way. But don't forget today and tomorrow is our big, big sale for Grant Station. The membership is just $99 here at TechSoup. So we'll be putting the link in the chat if you don't already have that. Some of you I know already do, but you may want to purchase it again and just keep that going until the year 2050. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> but Jeremy, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you, Jeremy Smith from Grant Station. Thank you for being here, Alice, and we'll see you in a moment. All right. Welcome, everybody. You. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Again, my name is Jeremy Smith. I'm with Grand Station's online education team. I'll be your host, and your presenter, though, will be Alice Runke. So be prepared to spend the next hour, roughly, going over how to take what little time you have and use that to secure awards with a limited staff, possibly yourself, maybe only one or two other people. Now, Alice is the president here at Grand Station. I don't want to spend too much time going into how great she is, because you can learn all about that on our website, grandstation.com, which hopefully you are considering purchasing membership for only $99.00. And it's only for today and tomorrow. It's the best time to take advantage of that. That's my hard sell for the day. Again, any questions coming in, put them into Q&A. I can track them and ask them or answer them as we go about it. And please, please feel free to use the chat to talk back and forth. And with that, Alice, let me hand it over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jeremy. And thanks, everyone, for being here. We have a nice crowd today, so I'm really excited. Um, what we're going to... Um, start with talking about is kind of just some setting the stage for why this webinar is important um, for us to attend. And so every year, Grant Station, along with our partners, we do a survey of nonprofit organizations across the U.S. And, <clears throat> and it's the State of Grant Seeking Report. So every year we get the surveys and we take the information and then make meaning out of the information as to how people are doing their grant seeking. And so um, the 2024 uh, report was filled out by um, over 2,300 nonprofits. Um, and I'm gonna share just a little bit of information with you about um, you know, things that you probably will not surprise you. Um, and then just how also you can use this information in the important work that you do. So it probably is no surprise that we have you know, hundreds of people on this webinar and that um, in our survey that the people involved in grant seeking at the nonprofits that, that responded to the survey with just one or two people that are responsible for all of that work was 74% of respondents. So you are not alone out there. There are lots of other people like you um, really trying to um, you know, figure out how to manage all of this, um, you know, their time and their energy and their return on their investment and all those sorts of things. And so I just want you to, you know, kind of at least understand that part that that you're not alone out there. There's lots of people on this call and just out in the nonprofit sector that really struggle with having the human resources to write um, proposals. And then we ask um, the nonprofits in our survey is what their greatest challenges are. And again, I don't think anything on this list will surprise us, but it's good information to have. Um, that, you know, the lack of time or staff is always the biggest um, challenge that nonprofits have. Challenges with researching and finding grants. And that's where an organization like GrantStation is here to help and provide um, those databases for you to find those funding opportunities. And right now for $99 a year, um, looking at just the increased competition, <laughs> excuse me, how long 
you know, the, the process of doing the building relationship take is always a challenge. Um, you know, writing, um, internal organization issues, you know, so you can kind of see the list here. Um, so you probably will find yourself somewhere on this list, if not once, but twice, um, or uh, more um, things that you are also challenged with as well. So that's why we created this webinar so that we can help um, kind of streamline that process for you and help those that are in small shops, um, you know, doing the solo work and, and trying to manage everything. So what we're going to do today is first talk about how to set real, realistic expectations about what is even possible for you to kind of achieve. Then we're going to look at ways to streamline um, how you write with some tools and tips and tricks on that. How to engage others in the process, because I think a lot of times, um, especially when you're a one or two person uh, kind of development team, um, you know, it's it's people tend to think that only, you know, the one person can do the work. And we're going to talk about ways to engage other stakeholders in the process to help you out so you can um, apply for more um, grant opportunities. Then looking at some of the artificial intelligence tools that can really help us in our grant writing. Uh, we at GrantStation really jumped on this when, you know, the whole, all those chatbots started coming out, uh, you know, a year and a half ago or so. And where it's it it helps to use artificial intelligence tools and where, you know, there's places that in the writing process you don't want to. Um, so kind of what are those tips to increase your efficiencies? And then finally, we'll talk about how do we do this with partners? How can our strategic partnerships help us to get more grant funds to serve our target populations and help us achieve our missions? So then we'll kind of take that question and answer at the end. So we're gonna start with setting those realistic expectations. And where this comes from is actually from the state of grant seeking. And so, like I said before, every year we do this survey. If in the future you get this survey, please fill it out because it really helps us to tell the story of what's going on in the sector. Um, but <clears throat> we get the answers from the all the people who filled out the survey. And then we have what's called a benchmarker tool. Now you can go to our site for free and read the entire report or use the benchmarker tool, even if you don't have a membership. Um, but if you want to use the benchmarker tool, what you do is you go in and you can just answer two simple questions to do the process to start. Where, what is your annual budget? And then what is your mission focus? because what you wanna do is compare yourself against like organizations. So if you're a small organization that does um, you know, animal rescue type things uh, with a $50,000 budget, you wouldn't set the same expectations if you were a hospital system with a $2 million budget or a $20 million budget or whatever they might have, right? You wanna compare yourself amongst like um, organizations, apples to apples here. So you just click whichever box matches you. And I'm just going to show you a few samples of what you can get in the report. But I just chose the small budget size under 100,000. And then I chose arts, culture, and humanities as the mission focus. So a small art um, organization. And what you can do from there is then compare yourself against all of these different comparison points. So you can look at <clears throat> how many paid staff you have versus them, um, how many sources of grant funding you have versus them, how many grants do you submit you versus them, oh, what's your largest grant award, you know, and those kinds of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can look at all of these comparison points. I'm just going to show you a couple. Um, but you can compare yourself against all of these different things to help you set those realistic expectations. And what you can do, Alice, is quick, uh, take a quick drink of water there. And I want to just put in a really quick question, which I think is good to just answer now. It should be a really easy one for you. Um, Beth mentions um, 
how many people do you recommend having in place when you are trying to look for a grant seeking? Their nonprofit only has one employee uh, director and there's one person, one person for the org. How many should they have or can they do it with just one person? Oh, well, you know, it depends on how many grants that you're seeking to write, um, you know, for your organization. So, you know, some are going to have a team of grant writers, um, you know, a larger organization, a small organization would just probably have one grant writer. Or you could also have where people are kind of responsible for their own program areas. So a lot of times, you know, um, you know, the, you might have an organization that does three different things and each, you know, person who's in charge of that particular, you know, mission area would be in, responsible for writing their own grants and developing their own things for their own programs. So there's no really right number or wrong number. It's just, you know, you want to look at how much you want to do and then make sure that you have the people that, you know, if you're doing lots of grants and that sort of thing, then you would want, obviously, to have a sufficient staffing to get all of that done. Um, so, so good question. Um, so here's just an example. The question was, what percentage of your organization's funding is from grants, right? So trying to figure out, you know, how diverse are other organizations um, with their funding streams? So you can see here, what you can do is expand every answer. And you can see for arts, culture, and humanities, you know, the largest percent is between 11 to 25 percent. Um, of their funding is from grants. Um, luckily, very few, only 10% is over 75 because that's probably, a, you know, getting to be a pretty high number. Um, but you can, again, see the diversity in that. And then you can also look at small budget organizations. So again, this would make, you know, very logical sense that a small, an, an organization with a small overall budget you know, would have less grants, right? But you can kind of start to look at your own organization and compare yourself against, um, um, you know, arts and culture and then small budgets. And then this is just the total of everyone. You can also do this survey kind of more in depth where you go through and answer all the questions for yourself. Um, and your organization, and then you'd have the answer here as to kind of where you're at. Um, so you can either do it mentally or you can kind of do it physically by actually entering the information in. But either way, you can just do the simple one of clicking those two boxes and, and being able to figure out how much grant funding other like organizations have. And then here is just another question, you know, approximately how many grant requests did your organization submit in 2023? Um, so again, this could be that, how do you set those expectations that are realistic and those sorts of things? Um, again, looking at kind of the largest percentages, um, you know, that 25% that of arts and culture and humanities groups submitted three to five proposals in one year. And then again, the small budget organizations, 35% submitted three to five that year. So again, this is where that can kind of help you as to, you know, what are other people doing? You can certainly shoot higher than other organizations or lower, but it's a great tool to really sit down with your board or your finance, you know, committees, or, um, you know, your leadership, if you're like, you know, doing the development work and benchmark yourself against other organizations and then have this report with all of these answers to be able to talk about your own strategies. And again, what's realistic and what, you know, what do we want to do as an organization and what, um, uh, you know, targets do we want to hit with how many grants we're seeking and how many grants we're getting and all those sorts of things. So you can run the report and then print it out and then, you know, use it with your team. Um, if you're a member, you can save it on your dashboard and then come back and look at it. Um, so it's a great tool to help you, you know, understand what other people are doing who are like you. So again, um, 
this is free access to anybody, a member or not. So you can just go to our website and then you go under the public resources tab and then you'll see the state of grant seeking. This is where you'll see the whole written report. And then the benchmarker tool is what I just showed you. So a really great resource to help you kind of develop that overall strategy of, of how many you should be looking for to submit and all of those kinds of things. So once you kind of have that plan of, of attack, if you will, and you, you know kind of what your strategies are going to be going forward, I want to talk about some different ways to kind of make your processes more efficient and more effective. And I'm going to talk about some different ones here. Um, the first, really looking at how you're making decisions on which funding opportunities to pursue. Um, and we'll talk about a process that you can set up that would just kind of become part of your, um, you know, grant seeking prospects where you're like using something like GrantStation, you're finding the funders, and then how do you decide which ones are going to be the best return on my investment, right? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about having um, that file of common attachments where there's just simple things that will speed up the process for your organization. And then what I'm always teaching in my webinars is using a, a project planning framework where what you do is you plan your projects out once and from that one time planning, then you can apply to several different funders. And so we'll talk about that. And as we're talking about that, writing those templates of things that just tend to be reoccurring in from application to application. So we'll talk about all these different ways to streamline that process so that um, you can be as efficient as you can with, again, the limited staff and time that you have. So I'm going to start with looking at that decision matrix to help you decide how to, uh, which funding opportunities to pursue. And that's what that decision matrix is going to help us do, right? It's going to help us make those smart decisions. And, um, you know, a lot of times when you are the person that is in charge of writing the grants and doing all the proposals, everyone's always just kind of rushing up to you and saying, here's one. Why are we applying for this? You know, oh, my gosh, this just came across my desk. And they're constantly bombarding you with opportunities and um, kind of asking you to shift directions Um and um, I really feel for the grant writer. I've been that grant writer. And so this decision matrix can really help take some of that stress off of you. Um, and what it's going to do is allow you to kind of run each funding opportunity through the same process and then help you to say no when it's just an opportunity that isn't right for you right now. OK, um, that as you develop this matrix and as you kind of start to use it, once you run, somebody runs up to you and says, here, apply for this one. And you run it through the matrix and you see it doesn't score high enough. Then you kind of have that blessing of your your, you know, board or your leadership or whatever to kind of say, no, this is not meeting the criteria we've set down for what we want to pursue as an organization. So kind of talking about how we create this matrix. And it really has three different components. First, kind of that criteria that's important to your organization. Um, and you these will probably and very well could be different from one organization to another. Um, and it And it could be a lot of different factors. You know, it could be that the timing is off or your organization's credibility or your relationship with the funder, or your human resources and your staff, right? So really looking at, especially those bottleneck areas for your organization and kind of saying, you know, the most important thing is that I have the staff time to do this, you know, that the timing is correct and that we've met all the criteria for funding or, you know, kind of whatever it is that you decide. And, and I'm gonna show you some more examples. Um, then what you do is you weigh those different criteria and come up with an overall score so that then you can decide, am I going to move forward with this one or not? So we're going to walk through each of these in step by step. 
So with that criteria, again, you know, looking at questions like, you know, is the funding consistent with our mission? Is, a, is it a good fit given what the funder already funds? Your relationship with the funder? You know, do we have things in place to already apply? Um, how competitive are we for this application? Do we need things like an audit or something like that that might knock us out of the running? If we don't have the audit, we can't apply or the matching funds that we might need. So you'll establish whatever your own criteria are. Um, and again, if you do have a GrantStation membership, we do have a decision matrix that you can use right on your dashboard. Um, and or you can create your own unique criteria. And again, I think that it's it's important to really see what are those key factors that are those bottlenecks in your own organization, right? So that so that you are really weighing those components heavier. Um, so that's kind of the next step, right? That that you kind of um, you start to assign a number to each of those criteria. So I don't suggest that you start with a, a wide range of numbers. I mean, a one to three scale or a one to five scale, you know, just can be just as simple, um, you know, not doing a one to 10 or a one to 20 kind of thing. Um, again, as you get more complex, maybe having the, the higher uh, range, but I think you just start simple one to three, one to five, and then really looking again at those criteria that cause you the most trouble. So if staff time is the most critical thing, um, then staff time is going to really be weighted much higher. If five is the highest or three is the highest, you know, you can really look and weigh those the most. Um, if the relationship with funder is the least important, again, those can be ones or zeros, um, but you can really start to look at your own criteria and then put a weight on each of those criteria. And I really suggest, I know we're talking about, you know, small organizations and that kind of thing, but if you do have like other people in your organization that help you, if you have the bookkeeper who helps to make you know, helps you make decisions on, um, you know, setting up budgets and these kinds of things. You can also check in with them as you're developing your own criteria and your own decision matrix um, to kind of say, you know, are there things that I'm not considering that really need to be considered, let's say, around budgets, right? Like if there's no um, indirect costs allowed, is that an important criteria? Or if there's matching funds that are required, is that a critical criteria that we'd want to weight higher? So kind of working with others in your organization will also help you to, you know, make the best use out of your decision-making matrix um, so that you, you're you taking into account per perceptions from other um staff members and other kind of areas in your organization. So you'll take each of those criteria and then you'll give them that weight to come up with a final score. So here's just an, an example of, of you know, the criteria that one organization had. Their, um, their key was they did it from a, you know, a zero to five scale. So again, you'll want to decide, you want to do, you know, zero to three, you know, zero to five, that kind of thing, and, and decide your key. And then you kind of want to decide, you know, which, where will you go forward? Where will your green light be? You know, where is that orange light of, you know, either needing, you know, leadership approval or more consideration, need some more questions answered before you can formally decide? And then those that just, if you don't hit this threshold, you just say, this is not an opportunity that meets our criteria. So again, you establish the key of how you're going to rate and then where that green light, orange light, red light is for you. Um, I really recommend that as you kind of develop a decision matrix of your own, um, that you run run a current a couple of current opportunities let's say run uh, one application that you have received through your decision matrix 
run one maybe that you applied for and didn't receive. Um, just to kind of test your own thought processes as you're developing it. Um, and then you'll find, oh gosh, I need to kind of adjust some of these things a little bit, um, you know, before I start using this for every single application, right? So kind of do a little test on it with, with ones that you were successful at and then ones that you weren't so that you can make those tweaks before you kind of put it into practice. Now, this isn't something that I think it doesn't have to take a tremendous amount of time. It can be, you know, a simple thing that one person, you know, maybe two in your organization could go through and kind of do this. Um, but again, what it allows you to do is to really look at those opportunities that score the highest so that you know that that's where your best bets are. Um, and these are the ones that have the best likelihood of funding. And then again, it also protects you as the writer, I think, and, and helps you have that streamlined process so that everybody can't just dump work on you and say, yeah, do this, do that, do that, when it's not strategically aligned with your organization and what you're trying to do. So that's the first way to kind of streamline your process. A second way is to develop a file of common attachments. And so what these are, this actually makes sense um, in the grant writing world, um, that this is you know, what, a, what funders ask you to attach to your application. And so these are just common things that they ask you to attach, your 501c3 nonprofit incorporation letter, the list of your board members, your audits, your tax forms, organizational budgets, resumes, job descriptions, those kinds of things. So what I really recommend that you do with this is that at like once a year, um, you know, somebody's assigned or tasked. And again, this could be a volunteer that also helps with this or a, a board member, or, you know, it doesn't have to be you as the, the sole kind of grant person in your organization. Um, but once a year, you you update this information with, you know, again, this year's board members and contact information, this year's audit, this year's tax forms, update those resumes, update those job descriptions with what changed last year, add the new organizational budget, and have this, this common attachment file either on multiple computers in your office or on a shared drive that anyone in your office that is applying for um, grants would just have easy access to. Um, because these are things that they, they don't take an incredible amount of time, but usually what you're doing is you're spending all your time writing the narrative and writing the budget and writing the budget narrative. And these are things that you have to attach. And if you don't have them handy, a lot of times, you know, you, you know that you have your tax forms done, but then the day that you have to submit, the executive director's on vacation and the bookkeeper's out sick and all of a sudden you can't land your hands on it. Um, and so then you can't get it submitted because um, you don't have that attachment. Um, and I've seen that happen before. So if you just have, again, this is a file that once a year, update it, and then it's good for everybody in your organization to pull from throughout the year, saves you a lot of time and stress in the long run. Um, the third and fourth ones I wanna talk about is the, the project planning framework. And so if you've taken any webinars from me at Grant Station, um, this probably looks a little familiar to you because this is how I'm always um, teaching about the writing process and how we put our applications together. Um, but what I'm always teaching is that if we go through this process of planning our applications and planning out every component of our applications and linking these components together so they tell a really coherent and consistent story, then it's easier to take this information once it's all planned out and pull it out of this template and then put it in the way that the funder wants to see it. And the thing that makes you know, grants kind of confusing and um, disjointed sometimes when we're writing them is a, a couple of different things. The first thing is that if I um, 
asked for 10 funders guideline instructions or 10 you know, requests for proposals or whatever instructions it is that the funder gave you to apply for your grants. And I said, let's lay out 10 different examples of funder guidelines. When you look at all the verbiage in those guidelines, it's gonna look like these funders are asking for 10 very different things, very likely. And yet 95% of all applications really have these major components, you know, your background, the need you're addressing, what you want to see changed and how you're going to measure it, what you're going to do and how you're going to measure it, and what your approach is, what you're going to do, and how that ties to your budget. Again, we have, we have um, a lot of workshops on this, how we work through this entire process. Um, but um, because you know people they don't do this planning, then when they pick up that that guidelines and set of instructions, all of a sudden all they start try to do is try to answer questions, and then the applications can get disjointed, and it can look like the things in the beginning of the application don't match the end of the application. The approach and the budget don't align. Um, you know, you feel like you're repeating yourself and you get confused and the terminology gets very confusing. And so this is where I'm always, you know, doing that preaching of plan once. And then after that planning, then you can take this information out, apply to 10 different funders with a lot more ease than if you tried to attack 10 different applications um, without the planning. Um, and then there's other kind of sections, you know, that can be written once that you can kind of template, if you will. So your organizational background, as one example, um, is something that you could write once a year um, and have and you could have it longer in, in scope and have, you know, the history and the mission and your initiatives and your strengths and the things you've changed in the community or how your participants have improved and really weaving in your strengths as an organization and what you've done in the past. And you can pre-write that organizational background. And then again, as everyone is, is going, uh, you know, if there's other people in your organization looking to apply for grants, they can just go to that one template and just pull from it, you know, reduce the, the narrative as needed for each funder. Um, but they can then, they don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to start from a blank slate every single time. Um, so there's lots of parts of these that you can kind of template up um, and reuse um, so that you're kind of streamlining your process. Um, so those are all really good uh, ways to increase your efficiencies in your writing. Uh, the next one I wanna talk about is that kind of the talent of the stakeholders and, and engaging other people in the process. And, and also, you know, I, I think that, you know, a lot of times, again, I feel like there's so much pressure put on us as the grant professional in our in our organizations. And it's kind of like people feel like it's all up to you. You know, you have to save the organization from going out of business. And so all by yourself, I want you to sit over here in the corner and do this magical thing that you do with grants and get the work done and then come out and save the organization, right? And we all know it does not work that way. Um, that we need to be working with other people in our organizations. We need to be engaging with our um, with the, the participants that we serve and that other people can help us out in the process. And so it can be a really fun activity to just do, you know, as an organization of pulling out the strengths of what people enjoy doing. And then feeding those strengths into different parts of your overall development strategy. So it could be that, you know, looking at your stakeholders, you have, you know, your staff, your volunteers, your board members, um, let's say key donors or something like that. And having this activity where you're finding out 
who actually does like to do some research that could do some of that pre-work to help you write those compelling need statements? You know, who can help with the editing process? So at the end of the application, you're really polishing up your applications to make them shine. Who can help with maybe doing some data collection or analysis of things that you've done in the past and really making sure that you're telling that story about your organization in a compelling way, you know, or who like when looking at other, you know, forward facing kind of development work with, you know, you get a grant and you want to do some public speaking about it or get that information out into the community. You know, who do you want to put in front of that microphone and who do you really absolutely not want to put in front of that microphone, um, you know, to help you tell that story. So I think that there's lots of just different strengths that you can pull out of people and then engage them in your process so that, again, it's not just you alone trying to do this. You're, you're using the talents of other people. Um, and the other thing with this is also don't assume that, you know, with people's strengths, that it's necessarily tied to their um, position in the organization or their career path. I mean, it very could be that, you know, the bookkeeper, you know, knows math and can help you with budgets and, you know, hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, could help you with those things. But maybe that bookkeeper also, you know, is the person that, that you want to put in front of that microphone to talk publicly about your organization or who really likes to do photography and, you know, do things to really capture the essence of some of your programs and things like that. So it doesn't have to be just their job descriptions. You know, it's like, what really jazzes Alice up to do, you know, and, um, you know, what do people really enjoy doing, right? So that's just a fun activity to do to get that help so that you're not doing it alone. And just kind of one other kind of thing of, of not going alone is just also looking at different kind of learning styles. There's lots of ways that this is out there in the world and, and these kinds of, um, you know, true colors or, you know, different kinds of things like that, strength finder, all that kind of thing. Um, but this is just a simple one of those, you know, action people, um, you know. And so let's just kind of do this. If you guys could go down to... Um, to the reactions and I'm gonna kind of talk about each one. And if I'm talking about who you are, hit some reaction, you know, hit a thumbs up or a smiley face or something. So how many of you in this in this webinar are those action people who really, they don't like to sit around and talk about it. They just like to get the work done, right? They, they just kind of just do it is their motto. That's how you are. That's how you kind of, yeah. So see, we got lots of action people in here, right? They like to get the work done, not necessarily talk about it all day, not structure it. Let's just do the work. Okay, great. Now let's see how many people people do we have? So people people are those people who are always, always making sure that the, you know, the needs of the room are being met. Everybody gets a chance to talk. I think my people people are walking in now. Um, they want to make sure that that people's voices are heard, that that you know people are engaged in the process. So nice. Yeah, we we need our people people. They're very, very important. Great. Now we have our meaning people. So these are kind of our visionary people who really can really look at how the, the work they're proposing fits in with a bigger picture. Um, they're really, oh, we got lots of meaning people. So, you know, very visionary, really outgoing and, and, and can really inspire people to, to achieve at their best rate. That's awesome. And then finally, our last group is our structure people. And these are the people who have their spreadsheets and they have their checklists and they like to see how everything is done on time with some order into it. Let's say we've got a lot of structure people as well. They like timelines and workflows and all those sorts of things, right? So look at what a diversity we have of learning styles in this room. And the reason that that you know I even bring this up as is you know being important is because when we are doing this development work and this grant writing work, it's like we need a team that has all of those types of people in it. You know, working with those meaning people, 
they're fantastic to work with. I love, I get inspired by them and I get jazzed up by them, right? But if you have a whole group of, of um, you know, the, the visionaries, um, you know, sometimes the work doesn't quite get done, right? Because they don't have the structure um, to get the work done or the action kind of oriented. They're always kind of out there in the future looking. Or if you have all, you know, all action people, then sometimes, you know, the, the structure isn't there. And so people start doing things, but it's kind of chaotic, right? Because there's not enough structure put in there. So you can kind of see, you know, what I mean, but really you want to kind of have your team be as diverse as possible in those kinds of skills and not, you know, I'm a people people, so I like to be with people people. Well, you need more than just people people um, to kind of get the work done. So just kind of a, a fun little thing to kind of realize. And, and I also believe that um, these are also kind of fluid. Sometimes you can walk into a room and, you know, kind of see that, that you know, one component is really missing. And you might, you know, as a leader, as a, as a grant pro, you might automatically walk in and kind of see, I need to add this component. You know, nobody's paying attention to everybody who's talking or listening. And I need to kind of fill in this gap of being a people person or whatever, what have you. So um, just something to consider as you're developing that team. And then I wanted to share with you um, uh, the AmeriCorps VISTA program. So AmeriCorps VISTA is, uh, is an AmeriCorps program. Um, there's AmeriCorps, that's just straight up AmeriCorps. And then there's AmeriCorps VISTA. VISTA is Volunteers in Service to America. OK, so the AmeriCorps VISTA program is um, a program that people work uh, or serve um, and, and serve in one year terms. And when they're working for serving with an organization, they are helping build that capacity of the organization. They're not providing the direct services that an AmeriCorps member would just straight up AmeriCorps. They would be, you know helping the kids in the classroom or, you know, helping uh, create the community gardens, right? But AmeriCorps VISTA would be those people who are helping do development work, um, helping to develop a volunteer program or helping to write um, applications and do fundraisers, helping to, again, build that internal capacity of organizations. And, um, you know, the, it's it's a process, uh, but if you're looking for kind of improving your own capacity as an organization, it's a really cost effective way um, to get, you know, full time service members to help you out with some of that development work that you're doing in your organizations. Um, and I've um, been on the board of nonprofit organizations that were all volunteer and we coordinated to get a VISTA member, you know, that then helped us with all of our volunteer recruitment and helped us, you know, do all of the back end kind of work to help the organization, um, you know, uh, train volunteers, do the volunteer work, all those kinds of things. Um, so something that I encourage that you look at if you um, can use that support, which who can't, right? Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the efficiencies with some artificial intelligence tools. Um, so like I said, we've been doing a lot of work at Grand Station looking at how the different chatbots like um, ChatGPT and Gemini and Claude AI and how those different chatbots really can help us with a lot of the development work that we do and a lot of that kind of planning and 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 writing our proposals. Now, I am not encouraging you to use one of those to create uh, your grant applications and just putting inputs in and then taking what the chatbot said and then cutting and pasting and putting it in your application. But there are great ways to use these AI chatbots to help you kind of create some first drafts, right? That you will then, you would put information in about your program and then you would ask it to create some drafts, you know, of a need section or an approach section or, um, you know, any other uh, background section, whatever. And then you can come back and edit it. Um, so it's a great way to kind of, again, stop that, blank page kind of problem that we sometimes have when we first start looking at our applications. 
or taking like that planning framework that I already spoke about and putting that information into a chat bot. And so you've already done the planning, then kind of ask the chat bot to write some of the narratives that your funders are looking for based on the what you inputted into the process, because it's going to take your own information and then create that first draft for you that then you can go and edit. Um, when looking at chatbots for like editing your proposals, they are really fantastic at that because they are large language models and they're built off of language. So, you know, having things grammatically correct, um, changing your voice in things. Um, perhaps you have a really formal proposal that you've already written that you would like to um you know, make less formal, more in a, a chatty kind of format that you're going to send to local businesses or something like that. And it can help change your voice and, and edit that proposal. Or a great one, while not perfect, is that it can also help you, oh, I guess it's down here a little bit more, reduce those narratives, which is always a challenge, right? You have a 10,000 word document and you have to get it down to 2,000 characters and it's like, oh my gosh, how can I even do this? And so it's really good at pulling down that information. It's not going to hit you perfect. So if you say, put this in 5,000 characters, it's not going to probably hit 5,000 exactly, but it will probably hit, you know, 490 uh, or, you know, 4,900 or 5,100 that then you can go in and kind of re-edit, but it'll get you close. Um, we, I use it a lot for just brainstorming ideas of just, you know, give me examples of, um, you know, how to put this kind of program together. And there are things that you can just, you know, get ideas from and decide, okay, that won't work for me, but boy, that was a great idea. Just kind of like having another brainstormer in the room with you. Um, then there's also just, you know, um, what do I want to say this, just kind of work that we do that's like, oh my God, it's so drudge, you know, drudgery today because I'm writing all these job descriptions and it's not fun and this and that. Again, it can create those first drafts for you that then you can go in and make um uh, uh make it relevant to your particular um jobs or organization. Um you can take your own old grants or your your own annual reports and load them up into the system and then ask it to spit out the information in a way one funder has their application set up. So again, using your own material. Um, and then it's really great, like I said, they're reducing the narratives, but then just summarizing narratives as well. And we've used it like when we get a lot of feedback from our webinars and it's written feedback like to ask these, these chatbots to summarize the main um, points of what our strengths and weaknesses are in our webinars. And it can take massive amounts of text and really make um, important meaning out of it um, to help you make decisions on, you know, how do I want to improve my webinar series or, you know, your, your own kind of, your own programs, right? So lots of great, um, great resources there. And then at Grand Station, we do we do have a free one that we've done just to kind of get you um, thinking about some AI stuff. So there's a free one on our site if this is really new to you. And then if you're kind of ready to go to the next step and figure out how to use AI for these different things, it is a cost, but we have a two hour workshop that we just did, which was AI 101. And it teaches you how to do this specifically. Um, so if you want some more support in doing that kind of work, um, we do have those resources at Grand Station for you. So my last part is looking at partnerships and how partnerships can really help us um, to, to sometimes take the load off of what we're doing a little bit. And so there's a spectrum of the types of partnerships you can have from the left here, the associations and coalitions and collaboratives, being, um, you know, the the least um, kind of um, uh, con connected and all the way to a merger where you'd merge two or more organizations, you know, which would be very, very um, uh in detail and and combined. Um, so these, you know, the associations and collaboratives, though, 
that's a lot of time looking at, you know, the, the target area that you're targeting. So, you know, looking at we're trying to reduce food insecurities in our community. And so who else is doing that work? putting that collaborative together or, you know, a, a coalition, all those words pretty much all mean the same here. And, and then, you know, possibly writing as a team and getting more funds, you know, that would then be distributed amongst the, the members of those coalitions. So again, that could help you looking at the issues more holistically and then, you know, not having to write every proposal yourself. I have written proposals um, for organizations where it's like two organizations, they're kind of going in 50-50 to a, a, a program um, and, you know, uh, you know, they shared the expenses of the, the time for the grant writing and things like that. Um, so that was a really economical, economical way for both of them to, again, combine their, their talents at their organizations and submit applications together. Um, uh, as a as a joint program. There also may be different ways that you can look at sharing support functions, um, all the way from office space and, and technology and things like that, all the way up to some of those development work. Um, so perhaps, you know, you need that kind of contract grant um, professional, but you don't need them all the time. And so maybe a group of you work together to, you know, have that person kind of on a retainer or on call to do work for a, a, a group of you. Um, and that way you kind of are assured that you have that person um, there to help you. Um, and then kind of all the way up to mergers, which is kind of a, a bigger deal of how you might, you know, combine with another organization, um, which would isn't all that usual, but, um, you know, not really the scope of this particular workshop. So the last thing that I want to leave you with is kind of looking at those fiscal sponsors. And the reason that I also want to look at fiscal sponsors is that sometimes within our organizations, especially if we're a small shop, um, sometimes funders are looking for things like audits. And one thing that I really encourage you to do is that if a funder says that an audit is required, that first you check with them to see if there is any, and let's say you don't have an audit, um, then you can work with them to see if there's any workaround for that audit. And so some funders will say, yes, I would like a balance sheet and I'd like a, you know, a, a profit and loss statement, blah, 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 blah. And others will say, no, without the audit, you can't apply. And so when that kind of thing happens or when, you know, you don't have that capacity, um, working with a fiscal sponsor is a really great way to, um, you know, still be able to apply for those funds. Um, but someone else is actually submitting the application on your behalf. Um, so this is just kind of one resource for you. If you find, you know, you're kind of out of out of the running because of things that maybe you don't have enough of or capacity for. Um, and you, do, you, you can be a nonprofit organization already and get a fiscal sponsor. Um, you can be a program that then fits under the fiscal sponsor. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, um, but that can be a good workaround for those small organizations that don't have some of those required um, components um, for submitting applications. So we've come to the end. I'm gonna take a drink of water and then we can get to some of these questions and answers. And there's been some good ones that have come in. And one thing to keep in mind is what we've done today is talk about what to do after you found a great grant opportunity. And if you're looking for a grant opportunity, that's why you should take advantage of the sale we have right now. For $99, you can get access to everything GrantStation has to offer, which is multiple databases that cover Canada, the US, and international work, also federal. And it's a great way to learn how to save yourself time, especially if you're a one-person shop and you need to find grants quick, Google isn't really working for you, maybe you can't afford some of the options out there. $99 for a year is very affordable and important to note, it stacks. So if your membership ends, let's say in October and you purchased it today, it would then stack to end the following October. So that's one of the great things about GrantStation, great things about the membership that you can purchase and 
we have lots of webinars available on our page. In fact, videos that you can look at on demand that cover all the different features GrantStation has to offer. So that's my hard sell and it's really <laughs> soft actually. So let's do some questions. We've okay. had a couple great ones that have come in. Um, all right. And this is one that I think it's right up your alley from Lauren. How do funders distinguish between outcomes, indicators, and outputs? Okay. So that's a great question, Lauren. And so the the here's kind of the biggest difference. Um, outputs are how we measure what we do. So outputs are doing things like counting up the number of people that we serve, how many hours of services we're providing, um, the ways that we advertise or the way we recruit people into our programs. Um, it's evaluating our approach. And so it's, it's really measuring what your organization does. Outcomes are, outcomes on the other hand, are measuring the changes in the participants that you serve. And so the outcomes measure how people change over time. And, and same with indicators. Indicators would be the more specific, concrete, measurable things, but those two are tied together, right? So outcomes just say the change you're expecting in the people you serve. And then the indicators are those specific measurable things that you're going to go out and evaluate. Um, we do a lot of webinars on this and like logic models um, that, that that would be logic model terminology. Um, and so those are that's the major difference between the two outputs measures what you do. Outcomes and indicators measure how people change. Um, also with those chatbots, they actually use the terminology correctly. Um, so you could also put your program information, put what you do say into a chat bot and say, remember this, remember this information. Then you could say, will you create me outcomes, indicators and outputs for this program? And it is going to provide you with ideas that you can, you know, again, edit, use, discard, whatever, but it is using the terms correctly. Um, which surprises me because sometimes even funders don't use the terms correctly. Um, so I also encourage you to use that just to generate ideas if you like are struggling with how am I going to measure that change or what's the difference, you know, between them. Um, and then also just Googling logic models for than whatever it is that you do. So logic models for domestic violence programs, logic models for um youth camps, you know, whatever, you'll find the way other people have done it. And you can look to see what you might be able to adapt for your organization. So even there, you don't have to start at a blank page. Outcomes, indicators, and outputs, Teresa. Outputs is the secret word you were looking for. So going on to the next question, this is one that I've never heard before. So I'm really interested in your take on this, Alice. Um, okay. Catherine asks if there are general guide guidelines for time spent on grant writing compared to the money that you're asking or applying for. You know, with time, of course, and expertise becomes easier, but she's new. Anything to pay attention for and be considerate of as you begin. So, for instance, should you be spending three months on a hundred dollar grant? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is that is kind of part of that decision making that you're going to want to go through in your matrix and that, you know, do you have the, the time, um, you know, uh, to write this application and is it worth your time? Um, and so I, I know here you're kind of asking, how do I make that guideline? Um, I, I can't I can't really answer that, you know, in particular, um, you know, it does. But you are correct. I mean, it gets easier after you write one application. You know, there's stuff that you're going to be able to take and reuse and it's just going to get easier. Um, but I think you just kind of have to do that cost analysis as to, you know, right now, do I have that? And, you know, is it time well spent or not? Um and uh, the other thing that I think um, with that, what was my other point? Da, 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 it becomes easier. Um, oh, 
in a, I'm sorry, I keep losing my thought. Um, so it's it's going to be kind of up to you and and you know how you feel about it and and your organization. Um, and there was one other point I was going to make, but I'll probably remember it in a minute, and I'm going to come back to it once I remember. But there was something else I wanted to say. Well, let's fit in one last question, a really okay. quick one here, which actually is a nice tie-in. Uh, Jill asked this early on, and it might be nice to just mention this. Um, you mentioned boilerplate or having a boilerplate answer to common questions. Do you tweak them to save time? Does that make your proposal less competitive? No, Jill, I don't think it does. I mean, I, I think that you want to tailor each example, or I mean, each answer to that particular funder. You want to use the header that and terminology that they use. You want to put it in the order that they ask it, right? So when I'm kind of saying having that boilerplate, it's really just, a well-written document that then you're going to pull information from and put it in the order that this new funder wants to see it. So it's not that you're just taking what you've already done and plopping it in over here. It's like you still want to weave it into that funder's requirements and using their terminology and all that kind of thing. So it really, it saves you time. Um, and then um, And then you're going to you know, kind of rework it a little bit to to tell the story in the best way for that particular funder. And if there are people- But under, again, you don't have oh, to start from an, a blank page every time. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. It, that's perfect. And there are lots of resources out there that can help you do this kind of thing. And a lot of them are available on grantstation.com. We even have a feature, which we didn't talk about today, which of course, there's not enough time in the day to do all this. But there is a feature on our website, which is called- the Pathfinder, and it's a way to find all types of resources. You don't have to be a member to use it. You can go in and say, I'm interested in this, and it will show you all the resources in whatever format you want. It's free, and it's a great way to find information to help you do these types of things. And in fact, one last question I'll go ahead and answer. Um, Safas asks, where do you recommend turning for assistance? If you're applying for grants, are there any online resources? And one of the best ones out there is a Grant Professionals Association. They have a listing of all types of grant professionals there, and you can find out more information about people who could help you with that. And Alice, any words to add to that particular question? Yeah, so, and I think that, you know, the Grant Professional Association, if you're looking for a grant professional to help you write grants, they're definitely the great place to go because um, they have the certified grant writers in their database. But if you're looking for assistance with learning how to apply for grants um, on, on GrantStation's um, website, if you are a member, you have access to our, our, our find, find the grants that you're looking for, then tutorials and resources to help you build a grant seeking strategy, and then how to write proposals from beginning to end. So with a GrantStation membership, you can access all of those online resources that we have. And with that, for $99 today and tomorrow only, you can yes. pick up access to everything that I've talked about in text and that we've mentioned you can find on our website. It's all available there on techsoup.org. And with that, Aretha, I'm going to hand it back to you. Any final parting thoughts to share with everyone? That was amazing. I learned so much every time you guys come. Thank you so much. It was a lot. Thank you in the chat. I'll be sending the video and the slides out in the next 48 hours. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.